Morning. No, we got it. I think it is the first. Oh, yeah. Is it just like brown hair and black and short? For you guys online, are you able to see the Safari page? morning. How's everybody doing today? Tired. Tired. <laughs> I know, it's an early morning class. Um, as you saw, there was not assessments and there was not a quiz posted. So um, that is postponed. So I'll post it today and it will be due on um, Thursday and then the quiz will be Friday. Yeah, two assessments for Thursday and then one quiz for Friday. So um, when they're posted, they will just be, um, they'll be published here, and so you'll be able to see them. They'll be titled the correct ones instead of them. And so the assessments um, will be just due at any time before, I think I do, a, it's either midnight or 10. I can't remember which one I put. Do you guys have a preference? <laughs> <laughs> okay, by midnight. Um, and then Friday, the quiz will become available at 8 a.m. until midnight. So anytime during the day on Friday, you'll be able to take it. How long did you say the quiz So the quizzes can take, I mean, they're, they're one problem. So, you know, 15 to 20 minutes, but you'll have like 100 minutes to complete them. So um, it will just be kind of one problem to assess, you know, are you really understanding this or not. Yeah. Yep. So it will be, a, it will have like answers. And so you can pick the closest one, but then submit your work and you'll get partial credit for your work. So the quiz will give you an answer right away if you got it right or wrong. So you'll have either like zero or 45 um, or a hundred, I mean, and then if and then once the grader looks through the quiz, you'll get partial points for those. And then you will still have the RLC will still be due on Monday. It will be one assessment for that one. And then Tuesday will be the quiz for that one. And we'll go over that material kind of today. All right, any questions about that change? All right. Um, Learning materials, I had hoped to get more on there. So right now, just rely on the book. So in the book, you know, we've covered a review is mostly all of chapter five. So I did not go well. So on chapter five, just um, you can, okay. It's like skipping chapter five here. Where should it go? Um, so I suggest going through like the exercises. Um, you know, for example, like this one would be a great one. And so understanding how to get those, each of those components. And so just make sure you kind of can go through, here's one where it's writing the V of T. And so go through these exercises for practices for right now, since there's not a lot of other material on there. 
Same thing for chapter six. Um, for chapter six, I will be posting, today I'm only gonna go over, um, well, I'll get to it, but there's different types of problems. And so I'll only be going over one type of problem today. And then I'll post some additionals for some of the additional problems for those for the other types of characteristic groups that we won't be covering today. And then we'll go over some more examples on Wednesday for the other two types. So hopefully we'll be able to cover all of the types of, um, of problems in here, um, but there'll be additional problems on online. So I will get some of that posted today, but if they're not posted, just rely on the book heavily for the practice problems. Okay, yes. What? Um, so it's 105. <laughs> There we go. This one has the numbers. So chapter five. Chapter four again. The joy of a actual hard copy is so you can flip through it easier. Um, all right, so chapter five starts on page uh, 248 is chapter five. And then chapter six, which is what we'll be starting today, starts on page 50. And the companion website has the solutions for all of those exercises. So when you do them, if you wanna go back to where you downloaded the, the book, and then there's a link to all of those solutions for the exercises in the book. So if you are having trouble with them, you can also ask questions in class at any time. Um, so RLC starts at 3.30. And I apologize, I typically will not post these like the morning of for the, these lectures. Um, they will start to be like beforehand. So I do apologize also that I just barely got these notes up. Okay. Um, so last time we talked about the capacitor inductor, we went through, this was the short little review of what we went over. And then we went through problems on finding the final circuits and the initial circuits to determine the general, this is called the general solution for an RC and RL circuit. So instead of having to derive that first order differential equation every time. We know it's of this form where it has the final value plus the initial minus final, E minus T minus T zero over tau. So that made it much easier to say, well, let's just look for tau. Let's just look for the initial value and the final value. So remember though, that when we find the initial and the final, what we can only find the values for the voltage or the current for inductors. And then we need to use that value for the initial at like right before the switch moves. And so once you find it with the switch moved, that would be your initial value. So if you find a voltage or current in the circuit, that would be when you would find it. All right, so we didn't get time last time to do the inductor. So we're gonna go through an inductor example of this, and then we'll move to the RLC. So for the inductor, um, same idea as what we did for the capacitor after being open for a long time, 
the switch is closed at t equals zero. So our zero minus, like right before the switch, which we call that zero minus, is what we need to find the values of the inductor. And for the inductor, we find the current going through that. So we need to find the initial is going to be really that. Um, the initial one, we're going to use the current at zero minus. And then we know that that current has to stay the same for the right after the switch. But if we found any other value within the circuit, we're going to use that as a current source. All right, so then once we, I already redrew this for you guys, but if once you redraw it, you have to determine what position is the switch and what do you do with the component itself? So for this one, what do we do with the switch? If we're looking at it right before the switch is closed, it's gonna be correct, open. So we leave it open here and So the equation that I told you guys you had to memorize was this voltage is equal to, the voltage across the inductor is equal to L di dt. And so if it's been sitting there for a long time, what does that mean? What's going on with the current if it's just sitting there? It will be flat, correct? So if it's flat, there's no change over time, right? So di dt goes to zero, so what does this go to? Voltage goes to zero, which means it's a, it'll be a wire, right? Voltage is zero means a wire. And so that's how you can determine is it open or a wire is by looking at that equation. Or you can memorize it, but that's kind of where that comes from. So we can just put that as a wire if it's been sitting there for a long time. So this would be our circuit we're going to try and find, and we want to find IL of T. So IL for this case of zero minus is going to be what? There's no source here, right? So if there's no source, what happens to your current? It's just going to be zero here, correct? So this is zero. No sources in this side of the circuit. So there's no way you can have any current. So IL will be zero there, which is also going to be right after the switch closes. So if I was to re redraw this, just copy this. So what is gonna happen here is that right when the switch closes, I would replace this with a current, meaning the current is zero there. So it's still gonna look like an open. So no current will flow through here. And then if I want to find you know, a voltage across say that resistor, this would be the circuit for that initial value for that one. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So since we're just trying to find the current expression here, this is gonna be our initial value. So initial value is gonna be e easy, it will be zero here. So now we wanna find the final value So what will our circuit look like for the final value? You have to determine the switch and you have to determine the component. So final value, this means that the switch is closed at t equals zero. So once it's, it's sitting there for a long time, where is the switch gonna be at a long time? 
open or closed? Closed. Okay. All right. So we close that one. And then again, we've been sitting here for a long time. So what happens with the inductor? It will be a wire again, correct? So both are a wire. And we want to solve <laughs> we want to solve this for the I L here as T goes to infinity. So I L on this one, if you recognize it's a current divider, but if not, again, I love node voltage. So node voltage will help me yield this. And I can say this is kind of all of this will be the same node. So all of these are in parallel. I can call that some V and I'll have minus 2.4 milli. For this branch current, what will this one be? Correct, Vx over 1.2K. This one, correct, Vx over 3.6K. And then this one is actually my IL. So that one will be correct. I heard somebody say it, Vx over 7.2. And I just note that that is my IL. So I have everything in terms of VX here. So it's just one equation with one unknown. So I combine all the VXs. And then I divide by this. And then I use that value and IL is just going to be the VX over 7.2K. And this will be my final value for IL. That open. It's just four over 15 milliamps. So this would be my final value. All right, so we have initial value, final value. We need one more value. We need tau. So with tau, you're always gonna find it in the final position. So for tau, you use the final position. So what was, what, what was the switch for the final position? It was closed, correct. And so, can draw sometimes. Okay, and then for the in inductor, we're gonna leave this open and we call this side A and that side B. And now we need the seven N equivalent between A and B. So we look at the pathway. This only has independent sources. So with an independent source, what do we do with the independent sources for, for equivalent resistance? So we're going to open this, correct? So this one will become an open. And then we find the pathway. Green. Not very dark. 
Um, and we go through, and then we see that this splits here into two. Into two here, which means it's going to be a parallel form. And then it joins again on the bottom into one. And so those two will be in parallel added to the 7.2K. So RTH here will be 3.6K in parallel with 1.2K plus 7.2K. And that ends up being a 0.9 kilo ohms. Oh, wait, sorry. Wait. 2K. So point, this is 0.9. So this is um, 8.1K. And tau is L over RTH, and L was 81 millihenry. So writing this, we have IL of T is going to be what? What's the form? Put it down here. Okay, so we have final, which was 415 milli plus the initial, which was zero. Sorry, minus. Final, and then E minus T over over tau, and then this is going to be in ants. So this would be my equation. There's two. All right, questions about this? Yes. So is it, would it be wrong if you just like put millions in it instead of amps? What does that matter? Yeah, you can rewrite this. So this could be written as um, sorry, this is the whole thing. Wait a minute. No, did I write this wrong? One. Right, these parentheses, I'm like, wait a minute, these parentheses are wrong. <laughs> so it should just be. <laughs> I'm like drawing a blank. Okay, 
there's the parentheses. So it should just be initial minus final times E and this should be by itself. So this is by itself and then there we go. So if you wanted to, you can just write it as And you can simplify that value too. And then you would say it's milliamps. Yeah, that's fine too. All right, other questions? Are you guys ready to try your own? Okay. All right, so go ahead and do same thing with this circuit, find IL of T. So introduce yourselves to your neighbors for today if they're different people. I'll meet you guys. I don't know if you guys. Okay, I'm gonna move you guys into a breakout room um, so that you guys can work on this. If you want to take a screenshot of this problem. I know you guys may not want to show your faces on the main screen, but in here I encourage you just to have more interaction if you guys don't mind for 
your um, video so you can feel like you're more interactive.
So to find this, I'm 
kill myself on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, the first step is to find that initial. So with the initial, it's right before the switch happens. So that is gonna be a closed wire here. And then this is sitting in a long time, so that becomes a closed wire. So then you analyze this circuit. And again, I like that node voltage. If you remember the current equation, you can see it's a current divider, but if not, you can use node voltage here. So this branch current will be minus 60 micro. This branch VX over 10K. And this branch is again VX over 10K. And so solve for VX here. And then IL is going to be VX over 10K. And that gives 30 microamps. The other thing you can see that it, it is just two of the same resistors in parallel. So it's gonna be exactly a half of that current. So if you see it, you can do it that way. Again, may not see it right away. So you can mathematically go through it too. So um, 30 micro will be right before the switch happens. And then right after the switch, IL has to stay the same. So IL zero minus has to equal IL right after the switch. So say I was looking for instead this I1, I would need to use the circuit, and then I would replace the current here by this 30 micro. And this would be my initial circuit to find any other voltage or current in this circuit. So here would be my I1 value. And so I1 initial would be just minus 30 micro. That makes sense. Okay. So going back to IL. So then we have the initial value. We need to find the final value. So what is the switch in the final position? It's just an open. And again, this is sat for a long time. So it becomes a wire again. And hopefully you can see here there's no connection to any power source. So that one would be zero. So final value would be zero. And then we need to find tau in the final position. So again, this is open. And now here you put A and B and you look for the pathway between A to B. And so hopefully you can see that this pathway, there's no splits well, I take that as I go around between A and B. So as you've seen, I actually physically put my pencil down or my highlighter here, and I take the pathway around. So I would suggest that to make sure your understanding does a split or, or does it stay in series. So this is gonna be RTH will be 10K in, per, in series with 10K, so 20K. And then tau is L over RTH. So L, we go back and see, is given as three milli Henry. So three milli over one, 20K. And that should give me one, I think it's 150 millisecond, nano, nanoseconds. So IL is going to be, I can copy this.
Um, so the final value was zero. The initial value is um, um, 30 micro minus zero for the final e to the minus t over 150 nanoseconds. Or I can write it, you can keep micro next to it or you can bring it out farther if you want. Micro e to the minus t over 150 nanoseconds. So it starts off with 30 micros and it goes down to zero. So it's discharging here and it does it in an exponential form. Yes. Uh -huh. So we found the initial condition for the inductor, the current was 30 micro. And so you, you draw it in the same direction that you found it here. And so that puts that current source going downwards. And I1 is labeled in this direction. So the current is going around in this direction, which is opposite the label of I1. And so I1 just is a negative of that. So if I wanna write, so here, what's the final value for I1? I think I heard somebody say it, zero, correct. That would also be zero. So if I wanna write I1, it's gonna be the same form. Final is zero. Initial is a minus 30 micro and then minus zero, e to the minus t, and it's again the same time constant for the whole circuit. So this would be the equation for I1 here. What if I wanted to write V of t here? Let me do this one. What if I want to find V1 here? Just the equation for V1. Correct. So we already have the equation for I1. So you can use these equations and then you know that the V times I or V is equal to I times R. So you just take that I1 equation and multiply it by 10K. So V1 here is gonna be I1 times 10K. So it's just a minus 30 micro times 10K e to the minus t over 150 nanoseconds. That makes sense? Yes. So when an inductor starts to induce a current, uh, it continues in the same direction in which the current entered the inductor. Is that my understanding that correctly? Hence why I1 would be negative at t equals zero plus. Yeah. So Um, I could have labeled IL like going up, but then I would have found it to be a negative mm -hmm. because of this, the direction of the current source. So whatever it, it, you can, wherever you label them, just keep them consistently labeled that way. And then you're going to find a value for it. Okay. And so if I had labeled it up originally, then I would have find it as negative and then I1 would still be negative. So it's more a matter of just keeping a constant convention. Correct. So wherever you start labeling it, whatever value you find for it, don't like switch it around because you found it as a negative. Just keep it that way and say, okay, with it labeled this way, it's going to be this value. Okay. So just, yeah, keep that consistent. Otherwise you will get a little bit more confused. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Other questions? All right, so now we're gonna move on to RLC. So we've only looked at the circuit now with one R, one L, and then the different circuit was R and then one C. So now we wanna look at what happens when we have a combination of RLC. 
So we're going to go through the same. Strong lecture too. Okay. So I'm going to look at this with the switch actually closed. So I'm going to assume it's closed. And then IC was labeled here. IC is going to be a function of T. And BC is also a function of T. So it changes over time. So when I write this equation, this is gonna be a plus. This one will be a negative. This one again will be a negative and this one will be a negative. So it's gonna be a plus Vs, a minus, the voltage here is gonna be IC of T times R and we know the equations we have I of C, we know is C dV, C of dT. And then we also know that L di is equal to the voltage across that inductor. This is an L. So this is gonna be a minus VL of T, T in there, and then a um, minus VC of T. So plugging in this, we get Vs minus IC of T, or I can rewrite that one with, right, so this equation. So that becomes CR uh, DVC DT, and then this one is L DIC of T DT minus VC of T. But we have two variables here, a VC and an IC. So one thing I noticed is that I have, do this as a green. I have this IC, so I can actually rewrite this as, I'll do it here, DDT, and then I have C, DVC, TDT. So if I plug in the IC there, this becomes a second what's called a second order differential. So this becomes C D squared BC of T over DT squared. And so my equation here becomes plus VS minus RC DVC of DT minus LC d squared bc of t over d t squared minus vc of t and i can rearrange this with the second order first and then divide everything by l of c and take all of the negatives over to the positive side and then remember this is a constant So 
I can rearrange that to D squared BC of T DT squared. Um, RC and then divided by LC. So the C's are going to cancel. DBC of T DT. Plus one over LC BC of T equals to VS over LC. And there's just a little notation you can do. I um, don't know what notation they call this, but you can just say this is A1 BC prime. So this form is a second order differential equation. And we can see like, okay, A1 is R over L, B1 is one over LC, and C1 is VS over LC. So we saw from the first order that the form was an exponential and because I already know the form is exponential, I can just say this form is going to be like a form of AE to some variable S T. And if I plug that in, it's going to have the second derivative of it, the first derivative of it. And so every term in here is going to have E raised to the S T. I can kind of pull out that E raised to the S T. And it becomes just copy this. <laughs> it becomes a quadratic equation. Um, with the S values in there, because E raised to the ST, if you differentiate that, remember the S comes down. And so for a second order, you're going to have S squared in there. And then for the first derivative, you're going to have an S. And so it's an S squared plus S. So it becomes a quadratic equation with S. And so if you remember from the sol solution of a quadratic equation, um, let's see, I'll do X, <laughs> a quadratic equation, AX squared plus BX plus C. When it's equal to zero, it has X is equal to the minus B plus or minus the square root of B squared minus four AC over two A. So it has kind of this form and it ends up looking like we can use these variables instead, a minus alpha plus or minus square root of alpha squared minus omega naught squared. And for that alpha in this case will be RTH over two L and omega naught squared becomes a one over LC. So I'm not gonna go through the whole steps of this because I'm just describing how these form. What we're gonna look at is like, okay, if I know this, how do I use this to solve the problem? This is a minus alpha plus or minus the square root of alpha squared minus no, I'm making that worse. Um, are you asking about omega naught yeah. squared? So you can rewrite this as omega naught is one over the square root of LC. Yeah. So this is, we've gone through this derivation for a series when there are LC in series together. You can do the same thing for the parallel RLC 
And so a parallel RLC has different values for alpha and omega, not is the same. And so the only thing different here is the alpha. So alpha and omega naught determine how this functions between the start value and the end value for these circuits. So just like we did before for um, just RL or RC, when they've been sitting for a long time, the C becomes an open, the L becomes a wire. So you can look at these for like initial conditions for the circuit and find what the initial value is, what a final value is, but we don't know exactly how they perform now between the two. Before with just one R and, and a C or an R and L, we knew it was an exponential form between there. So now we have three options of the way it gets between the beginning and the end state. And that's what these graphs here are depending on the combination between alpha and omega, that's what it's gonna determine how it performs between those two final and endpoints. So if it is charging up and it starts at zero and charges up to some value, it's going to have what's called underdamped when the alpha value is less than omega naught it's gonna follow that form. It actually looks like it's ringing. It's an oscillation. And what you can have happen is that it's putting in, so what happens here is the inductor value is actually charging up the capacitor and then the capacitor is discharging to the inductor and they're kind of oscillating back and forth between each other. And so you get what that ringing effect there. And so it goes up and then oscillates. And so that's why you're seeing it charges up quite a bit and then it becomes an oscillation. So that's called underdamped. The other way it can move is critically damped when alpha and omega are exactly the same. And that is, it looks almost a little bit like an exponential. And then overdamped is when it doesn't follow the exponential form. Um, and that's when alpha is gonna be greater than omega naught. So you have to find the value of omega, the value of um, um, alpha and compare the two to see how is this going to move from the initial value to the final value. Does that make sense? Okay. So same idea is if it's fully charged first and then I discharge it to go to zero. It can perform between those two values under damped. Again, it will oscillate as it goes down. So it goes heavily down and then it will ring until it, 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 um, it stabilizes at zero or it can follow more of like the exponential curve looks more like that critically damped and then over damped is where it takes it longer to actually get to the zero. So that is the forms of what's called underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped. So you do need to understand what those three terms mean and how the comparison of alpha and omega determine which one of those do I have. So now when we look at an RLC circuit, we need to determine which one of these three. Depending on which one of these three, this is just the summary of the overdamped, critically damped, and underdamped. We find alpha, omega naught, compare the two, and that determines which solution we're going to use. Depending on which solution, we have different equations we need to solve for. So this will be our table you're going to use very heavily. You don't have to memorize these, so definitely just know how to use this table. So here you see like, wow, this looks like a lot of information. So one thing you do first, find alpha, find omega, depending on if I'm a series or um, 
in series or in, I'm in parallel. So depending on which form I am, I'm just gonna use these equations to determine alpha, omega naught, and then I'm going to compare the two and say, am I underdamped, critically damped, or overdamped? From there, I'm gonna use, depending again, series or parallel. So this one is parallel, this one is series. <laughs> and so depending on which one I am, I'm gonna use these equations. So we're gonna go through first, this was what I was saying was I'll give you guys some additional examples for each type of these for series and then in parallel. So you have all six of these examples um, to be able to go and look at online. I don't have them up there yet, but I will get some of those. Um, and then what we're gonna do today is go through one example. So we're gonna actually look at one example and how do you use these equations to then write the full equation. So just like we did for the general form, these are gonna be our general form solutions. So if it's overdamped, this will be my solution form. It's some A constant E raised to the S1 of T. S1 is considered a characteristic root and S2 is considered a characteristic root. So those are roots of the, let's say this. They're roots of the system. Um, so that means that when, that's when the system goes to zero. So you know that that is a solution of this, of this equation. I can say this right. Um, and then A1 and A2 are described there. So you have to find the initial value, the final value. So that's what the VC of zero means. And the VC at infinity would be your final value. IC of zero means the current through the, the capacitor at zero. So that would be the initial current in the circuit. And then critically damped, it's gonna be this equation instead. And for under damped, it will be this equation. So for each of these, they have variables in there, D1, D2, or B1, B2. And so we're gonna look at how do you find those values? So, here is a RLC circuit, and we want to find VC at time greater than zero. And the switch has been closed for a really long time and then opened at time zero. So first step is that we want to find alpha and omega naught. And so one, are we series RLC or do we have parallel RLC? So we have series RLC. So we are gonna use this equation for alpha. So we have, and this is RTH, L over, or two over L, this is our alpha value. And omega naught is always one over square root of LC, or you can do omega naught squared, either way. When you're just finding omega naught, it's easier to write one over square root of LC. So we're gonna find these. So alpha here is, what's the R? It's just gonna be 20. And so that leaves a question like, how do you know if the switch is closed or open when you're finding that? So you look at it at the final position, okay? So the final position, and that would mean that the T is open, sorry, the switch will be open at the final, and so that's why it's only 20 there. So 20 over two times L, L is given as 10 micro. So we have 20 over 20 micro, which is one times 10 to the minus, or 10 to the minus six on the bottom, which comes up, so one meg. And this is a new, um, let me get rid of it up here. It's called Nieper's. NP, 
Neepers per second. I know, a weird unit. So this is a new unit for you probably. So Neepers per second is the unit for that alpha. The omega naught is more common, which is radians per second, which you're probably more familiar with, and that's angular frequency. And so this is gonna be Neepers per second. So N P over S. And now omega naught is one over the square root. L is 10 micro. And C is 100 nano. And this ends up being one times 10 to the six. And these are radians per second. And so we're gonna compare these two. And so what is what do you see here with that? They are equal. So we go up and compare, okay. Equal means that they are critically damped. So we are gonna use the critically damped equations. So for this, we need to know this initial value and the final value to find B1. And for B2, we need to know the initial current, the initial voltage, and then the final voltage. And so we're gonna go through and do what we did before is the initial value is right before the switch and then we switch the switch. <laughs> And that will be the initial value if we're finding something other than the voltage. But what we're gonna do mostly here is always find the voltage, VC, for these. And then we're gonna use that value like I did before and found IL or I1, and then we found V from I1. So we're gonna find it for VC and then use that to find the other values in the circuit. Does that make sense? Well, it will, hopefully. So let's go through this first. Um, so initial value is when right before this switch, it was closed. This is sat for a long time. And so the voltage is, or the capacitor is open and the inductor is closed. So the initial current is going to be zero because it's just open there, correct? And the voltage will be what? So if you want to highlight these, you can go through and so this is one node. And then all of this is one note. Correct, it is 16. So you, it's a voltage divider, 24 times 20 over 30, which ends up being 16 volts. So the initial for the capacitor is gonna stay the same right after we do the switch. So that will be our initial value is 16 volts. At infinity, which is our final, the switch is open. And again, this is open and this is closed. So what happens here? It will be zero. So our initial and our final, and then we have our initial current. So we can find these. B1 is gonna be um, 16 minus zero, and B2 is gonna be zero for the IC of zero, plus alpha, which is one times 10 to the sixth, our initial of 16 minus zero. So now we just plug that into the VC equation here. And we have 
B1 is 16. 1 times 10 to the 6 times 16. T, oops. E raised to the minus 1 times 10 to the 6, T. And then VC of infinity is 0 again. So this is going to be. That will be my equation and I'm done. So hopefully not as hard as it looked. <laughs> looked a little scary at first, I know, but it's, it's actually not too bad. So say that that term you below at equals zero actually have a function. How would you find that first variance? You're just doing the definition states. So this will still be zero, even if I find, or the current, sorry, the current there will still be zero. Oh. Um, so you could find VC is like 10 volts, say it had a power source in there, but with it still being an open circuit, you won't have any current going through the capacitor. All right, um, we'll start off next time. We'll do a quick review of this and then you guys get to attempt this type of problem with the groups. All right, any other questions? Yes. U of T is um, an impulse. It's an impulse function, yeah. So 24 volts is a constant, so it just goes to U of T. Sorry, I can't hear you. Yeah, I was just going to pull this up. Yeah, all of these will have that U of T because we have a constant current source. Okay. Is that will they go is that gone over in the textbook, I'm assuming? Yeah, so it's in chapter five. It talks about I think it's chapter five, it talks about the impulse. Impulse. So that's chapter. So it's chapter twelve. Then. Thank you. All right. See ya. Uh, section five dash three. Five dash three. Yeah. Okay. I'll go back and do that. Yeah. And that's then for R seven, uh -huh. for this, are you taking it based on since you're finding the like? So remember, so like for just an RL or an RC circuit, you do that. I, I did the same thing that kind of A and B uh -huh. nomenclature to then basically A is your positive node, B is your negative, and you follow yeah. the current through there to determine your R7. Yep, it would be the same except for just use the final circuit. Yes, but let's say that in the in the final circuit is so oh, because in a when you're doing R7 and in, in inductor is always a short circuit yep. and then, okay. That's why I was forgetting. So. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh -huh. I have a question. How do you so how do you determine where if the, the circuit is series RLC or parallel? Because in there, that's like both series and parallel, right? No, because the R's, so when you connect it, so you look at the circuit separate. So, for example, in your lab, you're going to have an RC circuit when it's switched to one side, mm -hmm. but then on the other side, you're going to see that it's going to be an RLC. Okay. And so here you can see, hopefully you can see that this is going to be. It's in series. They're right? in series, yeah. Oh, because when you open this, this doesn't. Yeah. Okay. And when it's closed, it's just supplying kind of voltage to it. But it's still the series. Yeah. So you're just looking at this. Yep.
Okay, but what if it's like a combination of both? Is that possible? Um, it could be possible depending on like one switch could be have them in series and then one switch could put them in parallel. And so you would have different forms for both circuit sites. Mm, okay. um, but it's like it's impossible for it to have like let's say instead of it being like this it's like there's another one that goes out and it's a uh, it's another inductor or another capacitor does it work so if it, you had say like two so mm -hmm. you had inductors yeah. like this uh, yeah for inductors you would combine them as one so okay. you would put these two in parallel would these act like um the same thing <clears throat> as like resistors so mm -hmm. they would be these two okay. in parallel what if this, if this is a capacitor though? If that was a capacitor, um, yeah, you wouldn't use this. We would use a different technique, oh, so which this, we'll get to. Oh, okay, so this is only for a series RLC. Mm, okay. And that means that you would have to combine the L and the C down to like mm. one L or one C. Yeah, okay. Um, but if you can't, then we have to use a different technique. We'll okay. get to that one. Okay, so we don't actually like that, really care about that right for Correct. Now. For now, okay. just understand just one RLC, either in series or parallel, mm -hmm. and okay. understand nice. how to find if they're which form they're going to take between their initial and the final. Okay, cool. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Yep. I was just confused about the unit at the end of that VCT that we got, at like the last equation we got. I was yeah. just confused about this new time. This is the impulse, um, and that's just because we have a constant source here. And so you use, we have to ask me about that. So the impulse function is described in chapter five or section five dash three. Okay. I'll go over it more next time. Okay. So I just put it on really quick at the end. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, but if you do want to go ahead and look at that, it's in section okay. five, five dash three. Yeah.